Jerusalem. In this city of the great king, there's one specific gate that leads directly to the Western Wall, Judaism's holiest site. On this program, we visit the ancient named Dung Gate and review its history and its special place in God's prophetic plan. Let us go, let us go up to the gates of Jerusalem. Our feet will stand in the house of the Lord. Yes, let us go, let us go up to the gates of Jerusalem. The gates of Jerusalem. Shalom and welcome to our program. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss. And we are so blessed to bring you our program from this new set, the Panorama of Jerusalem. We feel like we're almost there. And it's perfect timing for this new series, Jerusalem, Ancient Gates, and Future Glory. You know, the Lord says, O Hev Adonai Sha'are Zion. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. That's Psalm 87, verse 2. And it's true, isn't it? Yeah, and even before that, in Psalm 87, verse 1, it says that His foundation is forever in that mountain. Yes. And He loves the gates of Zion more than any other dwelling. There's going to be so many exciting things that we're going to be able to bring to you right from the God's land, His holy land, and share with you in your comfort of your own home. It's our joy to be able to do this. We also have some amazing guests that are with us, a good friend, uh, Rabbi Marty Wallman, who's going to talk about the unfolding of the prophetic time that we're in and how God is doing uh, just miraculous things with yes. the Messianic community. It's really true. Now, right now, we're going to bring you Shimon Gibson from Jerusalem. He's an archaeologist who has been unearthing the artifacts and the relics of the first century and beyond and really bringing to light the life and the reality of the Jewish presence of the land. And so let's go to Shimon Gibson in Jerusalem. The name is uh, Shimon Gibson. I'm an archaeologist who's been working in the Holy Land now for some 40 years, uh, which is quite a, a, a track record. Um, I've been digging here since I was a teenager. And in fact, this excavation that I'm standing in at the moment was excavated in 1975 and I was brought along. I was only 12 or 13 at the time to make all the measurements, uh, make, do the surveying within this site. And subsequently I then became the archeologist and uh, today I'm, I'm digging here. But uh, I have worked in different parts of, the, the, of Israel, digging different sites from different periods. And uh, in the year 2000, I came across an, a remarkable cave west of Ein Karim, west of Jerusalem, the cave of John the Baptist. And that brought me to the whole subject of the, the early Christianity and how it developed the Jesus group, Jesus and John the Baptist, all these other subjects. And these excavations were, were renewed um, in 2000. And uh, we've been digging here off and on uh, for a couple of years. But recently, substantial excavations are now being undertaken here. And it turns out that there's a mansion here, a priestly mansion from the time of Jesus. And it's in the traditional area of the, the house of Caiaphas, as we hear about it from uh, the Gospels. So this link between uh, Jesus and Jerusalem is something which I've been interested in, especially since uh, there are excavations which I'm working on for publication, which are next to the Praetorium, the place of the trial of uh, Jesus. And also I did, uh, I wrote uh, different publications, one uh, on, uh, with a colleague on the Temple Mount, all the underground spaces, and another one on uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, on the original topography and archaeological remains uh, below. So uh, I keep on coming back to Jesus in my archaeological researches. Now the Dung Gate is referred to originally in uh, the book of uh, Jeremiah, but uh, it today refers to the fact that uh, this gate was the main access uh, point for those who would come in and then take out the refuse, the rubbish, the garbage, all of the, the household uh, stuff which was uh, 
being discarded. It was taken out of the uh, city and then dumped. Uh, this, of course, is wonderful for archaeologists. We love excavating uh, fills with, with broken pottery and, and uh, animal bones and, and so forth. And indeed, just behind me here, you can see this thick layer of soil. This is rubbish that was dumped here in the Byzantine period. And uh, it was uh, uh, not needed. And uh, it includes a lot of uh, archaeological finds, which can tell us about the ancient cultures that existed here through time. Hello, I'm Wayne Fournier, and I've been a supporter of Zola Levitt Ministries for many years. If you see this outreach as worthy of your financial support, please call us at 1-800-WONDERS. Visit us online at levitt.com or write to us at Zola, Box 12, 268, Dallas, Texas, 75225. We depend on your financial sustenance. Thank you. We so appreciate archaeologists like Shimon Gibson. They give their lives to unearthing relics and artifacts that verify the Bible. Yes. We know the Bible is true. Absolutely. And yet these scientific discoveries help everyone else oh, to see such a treasure. that the word is true. Another wonderful archaeologist that we've worked with is Professor Gabriel Barkai. He's in charge of the Temple Mount Sifting Project, which we've been to. We actually have brought our tours there. Mm -hmm. One of our young men on a tour found a Maccabean coin mm -hmm. from the second century BC. It was so thrilling for us to be part of this unearthing of the reality of the Jewish presence in the land for thousands and of years. And when we were there, some of the young children that come oh. and their school, I mean, it's like, it's their field trip to yes. come and see their history. Yes. That, you know, the world is saying, you don't belong here. But the, the stones are crying out, yes. you do belong here. Yes. And you've been here for an ancient time. And yes. you're an ancient people with a prophetic destiny. Yes. You know, we're gonna go take you now to the Dung Gate. Despite its, uh, its different name, yes. it's the only gate that leads directly to the Holy of Holies. So let's go learn more about the Dung Gate. We're here at the Dung Gate, which is in the southern part of the city, and it's historically the place where the ash and the refuse would come out of the city towards the Valley of Hinnom and be, be deposited there. It's the southernmost part of the old city. Behind me is the western wall, and it is the holiest place for the Jewish people. It is the closest that they can get this at this time to the Holy of Holies. That's right. The western wall is the retaining wall that is the, built alongside where the temple actually stood. And so it is the closest we can get to pray as if we were close to the Holy of Holies. You know, the Dung Gate is actually a misnomer today because this is one of the cleanest areas in the city. And this is one of the places where you come in and out to get to the Western Wall. In 1948, the Jordanians had control of this, but they opened it to traffic. And then when the Israelis took it back in 1967, you can see that there's still lots of life taking place here. You see many bar mitzvahs entering in through this gate, and it's the choice that we choose to stand with the pilgrims and the people of Israel to make clear the coming of the Lord. That's right. When you are praying for this area, pray for my Jewish people. Pray that we will have a revelation of our own God, that we would get back into the scriptures, that would be turned towards the book, and that we would see Mashiach. We would be anticipating Messiah. We would be looking for him and that when he comes, we will know him. And that even before then, we will turn our hearts towards him. As Zechariah has said, we will look to him whom we pierced and mourn as if for an only son. So pray for my Jewish people, will you? In 586, the Babylonian captivity took place. We're here inside the Dung Gate, which it was rebuilt by Nehemiah back in those days. 
When Nehemiah returned to rebuild the gates, all the tribes worked together. There was resistance, but it's a picture for us of the body working together. In Nehemiah 2.13, we hear about the rebuilt gate, the dung gate. In 3.14, we hear specifically about this gate, the dung gate, being rebuilt under Nehemiah. We're inside the Western Wall area. Right near here is the Western Wall, the holiest site in Judaism. It is the place that is closest to the Holy of Holies and therefore is revered. It's the place where people come and pray. It's where the bar mitzvahs take place on Mondays and Thursdays. It's a significant place in all of Judaism. And then also for Christian believers, they come to support Israel from here. We're near the Southern Steps. We're near the City of David. The Pool of Siloam, which was just rediscovered and uncovered in the last few years, plays a tremendous part in the, in the Feast of Tabernacles. This area is almost a ground central. It's a very important area. The Dung Gate, surprisingly, is one of the cleanest areas in Jerusalem. This city is broken up. The old city is broken up into four uneven quarters. The smallest quarter is given to the Jewish people. You know, Psalm 122 says, Om dot hayu raglenu b'shareyech Yerushalayim. Our feet shall stand within your gates, O Jerusalem. And that's what we're seeing today. The Jewish people are back. Our feet are standing within the gates. And now, surprisingly and unexpectedly, Christians are coming alongside the Jewish people to support them. You know, during the Six-Day War, this area was recaptured by the Jewish people after it had been under Jordanian rule from 1948 forward. When the army came through here, when the IDF came through, three different companies were going through this area and going to the Western Wall celebrating. And in the celebration, the Jordanians were able to flee through this dung gate. Shocking, but true, that during that time of celebration, the Jordanians got away, and so be it. But today, this area is under Israeli control, Israeli rule, and it sets up for the future when the 12 gates will be seen in the new Jerusalem. Do you wonder about your future as a believer in the Messiah? Our founder, Zola Levitt, wrote a booklet that tells us what lies ahead. Glory, the future of the believers. Inside, Zola explains the coming rapture, our time in heaven, the kingdom on earth, and then eternity. Find out what God has prepared for those that love Him. Call 1-800-WONDERS or go to levitt.com. The wonders of the Bible can only be experienced in Israel. Zola Tours invites you to join Miles and Catherine Weiss for a dream vacation you will never forget. We offer a deluxe 10-day tour in the spring and fall with an optional extension to see Petra. A Greece extension is available for our spring tour. We handle the details. You experience the study tour of a lifetime. Call or click and join us. Miles and I would love to host you on our next tour and you can witness this beautiful land for yourself and see these ancient gates for yourself. They are really something to behold. We love to be in touch with you and Facebook is one way that we're staying in touch with you. Another way is through the Levitt letter that you can get just simply by going to levitt.com and asking for it. It is amazing uh, writing of compilations of things that are happening today, news that's happening today. And it's our way of saying thank you to you for standing with us and supporting us during this time so we can bring you these amazing, wonderful, times that we are living in in these documentaries of things that are happening here and now in Israel and in, and in the States. Yes, it's really a joy. You know, we have with us next Marty Waldman. He's the rabbi at Baruch Hashem Messianic Congregation, and he's also one of the executive directors for the Towards Jerusalem Council too. We first became aware of that, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. Right. A long time ago, we realized that there was a group of Messianic Jews and evangelicals and Catholics and Presbyterians and every kind of Christian, they were traveling the world together and seeking reconciliation by kind of bookending Acts 15. Remember, in Acts 15, the great doctrinal decision was do 
the Gentiles right. need to become Jewish to follow right. Jesus? Right. The no. answer was no. Thank God. Now at the end of the age, the question is, do Jews become Gentiles when they follow Jesus? No. The answer is again, <laughs> no. Towards Jerusalem Council too is promoting that reality that in fact we can work together, have a shared destiny while maintaining our distinctives. And so Marty is one of the leaders of that. He took time away from his busy schedule to speak with us. Let's hear from Marty Waldman now. Today, we are witnessing a prophetic phenomenon. That is, we're witnessing the restoration of the Messianic Jewish community of the first century. Most people don't, know, no, don't even know about this movement, but there are two major miracles that have happened in my lifetime. Many more, but two that I'd like to share with you. The first major miracle took place in 1948 when the, when the people of Israel who had returned to the nation, the land of Israel, became the nation of Israel and received statehood. Now statehood is simply a reference to a geopolitical entity, but nonetheless, it was recognized by the United Nations, by the world, the world community of nations, that Israel would be a nation. And Ben Gurion, who was the father of that nation at the time, didn't say, hallelujah, we've become a state. He said, thank you, O oh God, for returning your people to our homeland and giving our home back to us. So the nation of Israel, which is called the Jewish state, is really our homeland to be considered above and beyond the actual geopolitical nation state that so many people have issues with. That's the first miracle. The second miracle, which is not as well known, is the return of the Messianic Jews. That is, the people of Israel who have returned to the Messiah of Israel. And I'm one among those people. There are now a growing number of Jewish people who have trusted in the Lord by accepting Yeshua or Jesus as our Messiah, the Messiah that God promised to our people, the Messiah that God promised to the nation of Israel. And so we believe that that promised Messiah is Yeshua. That was his real Hebrew name. His name is known more commonly as Jesus. But now that we are here, it's almost, I don't want to sound arrogant, but it's like we're back from the first century. It's a miracle. And it didn't take place via any committees in the church that said, we need to reach the Jewish people and form a Messianic community. It was strictly the miracle of God, the power of God, the presence of God that has called us back into existence and into being. And because the Messianic Jewish community has returned, the now worldwide church, including every flow of the church from ancient churches, Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, uh, up to all the way up to Protestant and modern charismatic churches are now confronted with a reality. That reality is the Messianic Jewish community. Oh, the Jews are here and they want to stand up as Jews who believe in Jesus and proclaim our Jewish identity in the Messiah. And the church is saying, what do we do with them? So this is similar to the first century. So many Gentiles were coming to faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. The Jews had to decide whether or not these Gentiles needed to be converted to Judaism or to Jewish Messianic faith by circum circumcision. And the decision was no. The decision of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 was, let's be gracious, let's give grace. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And they sent the letter accordingly. Now what we're dealing with and it sounds bizarre, but the real question is, when Jews come to faith in Jesus, do we have to become uncircumcised? I know that physically that's probably impossible, but in, in, a, in a spiritual sense and in the sense of the community of believers, that question has arisen. And so the Tor Jerusalem Council is addressing that very ancient wound between Jews and Gentiles and the unity that was attacked and destroyed between Jews and Gentiles in the body that we are now addressing and hoping that through our obedience to the Lord, following this vision, 
that God will once again restore the unity that the Apostle Paul describes in Ephesians chapters 2 and 3 and also in Romans chapter 11 with the olive tree unity that's described there. So the miracles that we're seeing today are actually akin to the miracles that were seen in the first century. I personally am extremely excited about this because I believe one of the reasons that the Messianic Jewish community has been resurrected from the first century is because we are proclaiming the nearness and the, of the coming of our Messiah, Yeshua. Very exciting. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you ordained, what is man that you were mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Excellent is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name. And we know that our accuser, you can still with the praises of singers, we infants and babes, whom you've ordained. What is man that you were mindful of him, and the son of man that you visited? to claim the name Yeshua, you came a little lower than the angels, and you humbled yourself, only to be exalted, Messiah, your Marty Getz, longtime friend of our ministry and wonderful Messianic musician. I know you love his music, as do we. You know, this whole story about the gates reminds us that God is going somewhere. He's yeah. bringing us into himself. Future He's glory. bringing us into the future glory and really hearing Marty speak about the reconciliation mm -hmm. that's taking place through the Messianic movement. It's very encouraging to us. Mm -hmm. We've been on this trail for a while. And you know, it's not an ecumenical movement like you would see uh, false uh, ideologies right. coming together to agree upon that which is not agreeable. Unity for the sake of unity. Exactly. This is something else. It has to do with healing. It has to do with repentance and healing. Mm -hmm. In fact, 
uh, we've seen that as well, where uh, pastors will awaken right. to their ignorance of the Jewish part of the gospel, their ignorance of the, the Jewish identity of Jesus mm -hmm. and how they've allowed us and embraced us. And we've been working for years along this trail. I remember when we first started going to Israel. Well, and the rebirth of Israel is, is the key because it, it shows people that God is keeping his covenants with Israel yes. and his people yes. and that they're not replaced and the church did not replace exactly the Jewish so. people. There's something more that God's wanting to do mm -hmm. that he's doing already in our midst. I know uh, one of our signature scriptures is Ephesians 2. Right. He's broken down the middle wall of partition, that which has called us to have separation, yes. and He's made us both one. Yes, we're, we're prophetically linked, but there's a distinctive Absolutely. between Jews and Gentiles, yeah. and we get to keep that. Yes. Uh, so it's been an incredible journey to see how God is doing that. Romans 9 through 11 speaks about all Israel being saved, uh -huh. walks through that amazing picture of the olive tree right. and how the Gentiles are grafted in right. to the commonwealth of Israel. Right. And really, we're seeing that. We're seeing that in California. We're seeing that around the world. There's this awakening taking place that's really... Uh, you can sense the coming of the Lord based on that. I love how you always said you didn't have to repent from being Jewish, Correct. but you repented from your sin. Yes. But God is restoring the Jewish people in their identity yes. in their Messiah, yes. Yeshua. Yeah, and it's growing. It's growing every right. day. You know, we, we one of our works is in Napa, California, known for its fine wine. Well, there's new wine there. Absolutely. And the new wine is this understanding of the shared destiny of Jews and Christians right. and coming together in Messiah. Right. Uh, we had people come to our congregation. She said, I've been waiting my whole life for this. Yes. I was raised Jewish, but as a young girl, I always wanted to know about this Jesus. Mm. And I felt like it was a forbidden thing, yes. but she knew that Jesus was her Messiah. And so coming to our congregation, she said, it's like a dream come true. Yes. You're answering the questions that I've had all my life yes. that can I still be a Jewish person yes. and believe in Jesus? Yeah. That's what I love about this gate series. We're going to be going through each gate. Yes. And as we do, it's going to open up a wealth of information and understanding right. about our walk as believers. Right. So what's Absolutely. coming up next week? You know, next week, please join us. We get a chance to look at some more ancient gates in Jerusalem, and we're going to be going to the Zion Gate. Yeah, it's going to be great. Until we see you. We always like to remind you, Shalu, Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, is free and full of insightful articles and news commentary from a messianic perspective. Visit levitt.com to find our newsletter, along with current and past programs, our television schedule, and much more. Don't forget to order this week's resource by calling 1-800-WONDERS or you can purchase it from our catalog at levitt.com. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries help these organizations bless Israel. Please remember, Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.